Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Little River United Church of Christ, an open and affirming congregation. We give thanks that we have been meeting in one way or another since 1955, and we are so glad that you all joined us for another Sunday on Zoom. Today is a special day. It is Faith and Democracy Sunday in the United Church of Christ. So we will be hearing a lot more about that in our service this morning. I wanna say a special thanks to our Faith and Democracy team at Little River, Jan Curtis, Drew Nenninga, and Jean Wheelock. Thank you for all of your work thus far and for helping to put this service together. It takes so many folks to make worship happen on Sunday morning and we are always in need of volunteers. So if you're interested in being a liturgist, being a greeter, being our prayer person or our T's and C's note taker, uh, please do sign up online or email the church office. A reminder as it's getting much nicer outside, um, our labyrinth is open and available to anyone who would like to come by and walk or pray. Feel free to come to the church anytime and do that. There are also still fair trade items that are available at the church. So if you would like to arrange a no contact pickup, please do contact John Davis and he can schedule something with you. A reminder that later this afternoon, our Board of Outreach and Social Justice will meet via Zoom at 2 p.m. And a re reminder that our children and youth choir rehearsals have started. So if you have a child or a teenager who is interested in being part of our music program, please do contact Ashton or the church office for more information about that. Next Sunday, we are participating in a special event called Climate in the Pulpit. That's an initiative of the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions, a local organization that promotes sustainability in Fairfax County. And on that Sunday, we are going to welcome Bruce Summers to our virtual pulpit. I am taking first. So if you need something, please just a quick reminder about Zoom etiquette. Um, please do keep yourself on mute during the service and refrain from chatting, except for the passing of the peace and the Thanksgivings and concerns time. That way we can all focus on worship. And at this time, I would like to invite our liturgist for this morning, Ruth Duncan, to unmute herself and lead us in this morning's call to worship. God is here. God who loves each of us without measure and welcomes us from every race, color, creed, language, culture, and orientation. God who sees us and knows us all is here. Hallelujah. Let all the people praise God. Justice right. 
Join me in the invocation. Gracious and compassionate creator, we are gathered to worship you. You are great and worthy of all praise. We quiet our hearts and minds so we may hear and respond to your voice. You are great and worthy of all praise. Christ of our hearts, be enlivened in and among us. You are worthy and great, worthy of all praise. Live through us as doers of justice, lovers of mercy, and as those who walk humbly with you. You are great and worthy of all praise. This, so we may become the beloved community where all may live with dignity and in peace, because you are great and worthy of all praise. Amen. this time I'm going to unmute everybody and we can share a message of greeting with one another. We know if John's here. The peace of Christ be with you. And also, and also, also, with, also you. with you. Everybody. Peace to one and all. Good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone. Good morning. 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 I have no idea where my picture is, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> Good morning, you can hear you, and that's all that matters. Yep. Uh, Hi, everybody. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, Kathy. I don't think we're doing our. Good morning, everyone. Peace be with you all. Okay. To put us back on mute now, and we're going to continue on with our service. <clears throat> My soul cries out with a joyful shout that the God of my heart is great, and my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the ones who wait. You fixed your sight on your servant's plight, and my weakness you did not spare. So from east to west shall my name be blessed, could the world be about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears for the dawn, dawn is near and the world is about to turn.
This time I'd like to invite Jean Wheelock to lead us in our scripture reading this morning. Next, God spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the big city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They're in a bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. This time, Jonah started off straight for Nineveh obeying God's orders to the letter. Nineveh was a big city, very big. It took three days to walk across it. Jonah entered the city, went one day's walk and preached, in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh listened and trusted God. They proclaimed a city-wide fast and dressed in burlap to show their repentance. Everyone did it, rich and poor, famous and obscure, leaders and followers. When the message reached the king of Nineveh, he got up off his throne, threw down his royal robes, dressed in burlap, and sat down in the dirt. Then he issued a public proclamation throughout Nineveh authorized by him and his leaders. Not one drop of water, not one bite of food for man, woman, or animal, including your herds and flocks. Dress them all, both people and animals, in burlap and send up a cry for help to God. Everyone must turn around, turn back from evil life, and the violent ways that stain their hands. Who knows? Maybe God will turn around and change his mind about us. Quit being angry with us and let us live. God saw what they had done, that they had turned away from their evil lives. He did change his mind about them. What he said he would do to them, he didn't do. Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God. God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. God said, what do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. He went out of the city to the east and sat down in a sulk. He put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city. God arranged for a broad-leafed tree to spring up. It grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of his angry sulk. Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. Life was looking up. But then God sent a worm. By the dawn of the next day, the worm had bored into the shade tree and it withered away. The sun came up and God sent a hot, blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head. 
and he started to faint. He prayed to die. I'm better off dead. Then God said to Jonah, what right do you have to get angry about this shade tree? Jonah said, plenty of right. It's made me angry enough to die. God said, what's this? How is it that you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree that you did nothing to get? You neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next night. So why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? This big city of more than 120,000 childlike people who don't yet know right from wrong to say nothing of all the innocent animals. It's an amazing coincidence that this selection from the book of Jonah is our lectionary text on this Faith and Democracy Sunday. When we think of Jonah, usually our first thought takes us to the image of an unlucky man stuck inside the belly of a large fish, praying for deliverance. We think of how strange and awful it must have been to feel trapped like that, alone, distraught, unsure of what's going to happen next because you have no control over the situation. Some of us be, may be feeling some of those very same feelings given the news of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing. But Jonah survived that. God was merciful, and after three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, he was spat up on dry land. Immediately after that is where our text begins for today. God gives Jonah the same assignment that he previously ran away from. God says, go to Nineveh and tell them that they are not following my ways and they need to repent or be destroyed. Jonah had been reluctant to do this in part because he's an Israelite. He didn't want to go into foreign territory and pronounce their destruction. He was probably scared on some level, but he also knew God very well at this point. He knew that God was not only just, but merciful when we are not deserving of such grace. So he imagines the Ninevites receiving God's word and repenting. And just imagining this group of foreigners, these obvious sinners, receiving the same mercy and the same grace that he had just benefited from is unacceptable to Jonah. The Bible says he was angry. Now Jonah had options. He could choose to be grateful to God and delight in the sharing of the good news with other communities so that they could also experience the blessing of God. But that's not what he does. His heart is not there. Jonah goes to Nineveh and makes the pronouncement that God tells him. The people listen and respond with an extreme form of penitence. Everyone puts on sackcloth and sits in the ashes. Everyone dresses in mourning clothes, even the animals. Everyone fasts from food and water. Jonah is watching all of this and he's feeling some type of way about it. He knows that even in Israel's best moments, it never responded to God's commands with such zealous devotion. He is growing increasingly resentful in addition to just being angry. But God is watching too and decides not to follow through on destroying Nineveh. But Jonah doesn't take that well. He can't tolerate God's mercy being shared equitably with people he considers undeserving and unworthy. He resents the fact that his God is compassionate towards the foreigners on the other side, Israel's enemies. And as chapter four unfolds, we see Jonah condemns God based on his own estimation 
of what is just and consistent. He does not want God to be who God is. He does not approve of a God who is just and merciful, sovereign and yet responsive to our prayers. Hate and bitterness overwhelm Jonah and he wishes he were dead. Now Jonah may seem like an extreme example, but like Jonah, we too are often displeased when God's grace does not match our own sense of justice, which is aimed most often at those we do not know, we do not like, who look different or sound different, or whose life experiences we cannot identify with. But on this Faith and Democracy Sunday, let me be clear, do not be like Jonah. As I said before, Jonah has options, but instead of celebrating the liberation of others, Jonah pouts and runs away again. He does so stubbornly hoping that God will come around to his point of view and agree that it is unfair for Nineveh to be saved. He's hoping God will destroy Nineveh after all. So he leaves the city to ascend a hill and sit there in hopes that he'll get a front row seat to Nineveh's destruction. Saying all the while that he would rather die than accept God's decision to be merciful to the Ninevites. But it isn't long before Jonah finds himself once again in need of grace and mercy. It's extremely hot outside and soon Jonah gets very uncomfortable out there in the sun. So God, in an act of mercy, sends a tree to spring up and offer shade to Jonah. And for the first time in this text, we see him respond joyfully. He's happy and comforted by the shade. The next day, God sends a worm to attack the tree and it shrivels up. Hot winds from the east come in and make the sun feel even hotter on Jonah's head. And even though he makes it through the night to see another day, Jonah holds on to his anger and maintains that he'd rather die than see other people get their blessing. So God asks him, what do you have to be mad about? You didn't plant the tree or nurture its growth. You didn't water it. I did that. So why are you mad at the thought of me doing that same thing for thousands of people and animals in Nineveh? It's a powerful commentary on privilege spoken directly by God. Jonah is mad not because the tree withered and died, but because God dared to give other people the same blessing. As God correctly points out, Jonah did nothing to, to deserve the blessings he experienced. When God told Jonah to go to Nineveh the first time, Jonah decided to run away, steal away on a boat headed to Tarshish. God could have let him drown when the sailors of that boat tossed him overboard, but God had mercy and sent a fish to swallow him before he even hit the water. God listened to Jonah's prayers and pleas for help and showed compassion with the fish and later with the tree. And instead of being grateful and dedicating his life to listening to God and sharing the ways he had been blessed with others, he decided to stay mad. Now the book of Jonah ends here. We don't know if he ever came around and celebrated the liberation of the Ninevites. But God makes it clear that Jonah is full of self-interest rather than a devotion to the justice he claims to be devoted to. As we approach this crucial election, let us remember that God cares for all people. God's love and mercy extends beyond all human and national borders. And if we're going to be faithful to God, we should vote in a way that is devoted to God's sense of justice and mercy. This entire year, 
and especially the last 48 hours, has shown us just how fragile our democracy really is. It's more important than ever for us to have a clear sense of how our faith compels us to participate in the electoral process. There's a lot on the line with this election. Civil rights, climate change, the growing wealth gap, just to name a few. So now we are going to hear three special messages from clergy in the wider Central Atlantic Conference that illustrate just how our faith and our values should be reflected in our voting. I'm Reverend Graylin Scott Hagler. I'm the senior pastor of Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ. And I want to speak to us today uh, about a scripture that comes from the 13th chapter of Matthew, verses 24 to 29, that speaks about the weeds growing along with the wheat and the owner of the field saying, do not uproot them now, for in uprooting them, we may pull up the wheat along with the weeds. Let them grow together so that when judgment day comes, we can separate the wheat from the weeds. It all happened while they were asleep. While they were asleep, something happened in the field, that the field, though it was planted with good seed, had become polluted with weeds. And I just want to suggest to us that we have been in the weeds for a long, long time in the United States of America. We voted for the left, we voted for the right, we voted for conservatives, we voted for liberals, we voted for progressives, but we never voted to undo white supremacy and we never voted to promote racial justice. And what I'm saying in this is that we have gone and we've supported what has been our favorite candidate and our favorite candidate may have won or lost, but just about each and every time, the candidate of racial justice has always lost and white supremacy has continued to be promoted. So as we go to the polls to, to vote, I'm gonna ask that we don't vote right, we don't vote left, we don't vote Democrat, we don't vote Republican, we don't vote for any of those other things, but we vote for our values, values that attempt to defeat white supremacy and to uh, promote racial justice. We vote for values that continue and promote uh, the dignity of persons and the worth of people. We vote for all of those values that, that are an important part of our own faith tradition. You see, as we talk about being a faithful people, we envision a world where there is radical inclusivity. We visualize a world where workers are promoted, where the poor are lifted up and safeguarded, where inmates who are returning home are received, where we dismantle the prison industrial complex, where we deal with the environment, Vote for those kinds of values, but most importantly is when the voting is all over, we got to realize that we have to be engaged and continue to organize and continue to agitate because even if our person is elected, our person will not do the heavy lifting of dismantling white supremacy or promoting racial justice unless they're pushed to do so. And that's our job is to push whoever is in office, whoever has been elected, to do the right thing, even when it doesn't seem like the easiest thing to do, to push them so that they have to do it anyway. Vote for racial justice. In Genesis chapter one, we hear God bless them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply in the earth. We've been blessed to awaken in our creator's verdant and achingly lovely world, a blue green droplet spinning in the vast cosmos, filled with a wild array of glorious creatures. Sadly, we take our fellow beings for granted treating them simply as objects to be consumed, raw material to be utilized for economic gain or entertainment. It's time we awake to the fact that we share our planet and genetic code with all of them, and they're more our cousins than our property. 
As people of faith who follow the golden rule, perhaps it's time to treat the natural world as we would want to be treated ourselves. I read recently about a whale that had become caught in a mess of fishing net so that she couldn't move and would soon drown. A group of divers were called out to help and very carefully they cut through the web of nylon holding this whale down. They cut around the fins and back flippers aware that they could easily be severely hurt if the whale began to lash and struggle. One diver spoke with awe of looking directly into her enormous eye, which seemed gentle and curious. Finally, when all of the fishing net was cut, the whale floated free, but then turned around suddenly. She swam up to each of the divers and gently nuzzled them. The divers were convinced that the whale had turned back out of gratitude to thank each of them for saving her life. We share similar feelings, sight, breath, grief, and love with other wondrous creatures. Our climate crisis is humbling us to recognize our place in the great web of life. It's time to plant seeds of a new tomorrow, founded on harmony and simplicity, in tune with the rhythms of nature and connections with our loved ones, even those with fins and feathers, scales and fur. Now's the time to fight against climate change by joining local groups like 350.org, the Sierra Club, Extinction Rebellion, or the Sunrise Movement, and vote. Nothing will change if we the people don't fight for what we love. peace of Christ be with you. My name is Ryan Sermons. I'm pastor at the United Church of Christ of Annapolis. We may all claim a desire for a just economy, but our goals for economic justice are held in check by our fears of scarcity. Economic injustice is rooted in what Walter Brueggemann called the myth of scarcity. Our job is to break through that myth to reveal God's abundance. This is not an easy job. Those who hold the levers of power are invested in maintaining that myth. The most effective way to break through that myth is to organize the economic power of our households and communities. Jesus demonstrated how to do this when he instructed the disciples to feed 10,000 people in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. The disciples were paralyzed. They couldn't begin to think of where to get enough food, having brought with them a few loaves of bread and fish for their own consumption. Jesus directed the anxious disciples to organize people into groups of 50 to 100. By doing this, an amorphous crowd became groupings of communities. It's easy to anonymously eat a snack in a crowd and not worry about the people around you. It's far more difficult to not share when you have to look your neighbors in the face. As people became part of organized communities, Food was not only found miraculously in their midst, but so much that there were leftovers. The miracle was a triumph of ever-present abundance over the myth of scarcity. Economic justice is fundamentally about power. For power to be effective, it must be organized. As with community organizers before me, I define power simply as organized people and organized money. Our churches represent a body of organized people with organized money. Check your church budget if you don't believe that. Each household is also a body of organized people with organized money. Therefore, each church and each household has a certain amount of power. How we use that power is a reflection of our values. Robert Connolly, a veteran organizer and stewardship fundraiser, makes this clear when he says, if you want to know what you really believe in, Look at your checkbook and your credit card statement and see what you spend your money on. What are steps you and your church, community, and household can organize to not only lift the veil of the myth of scarcity, but also recognize abundance? How can you be a better organized community that recognizes one another? How can you make sure your economic power, your credit card statement, your checkbook, and that of your church reflects your values? I assure you, it is not easy. As Reverend Sermons just said, 
Um, it's important to recognize the abundance in our communities and in our world as we approach this election season and as we move into a new year. So at this time, I would like to invite Ellen Wortman, member of our stewardship committee, to talk to us a little bit about next year's pledge campaign. Good morning, church. Your stewardship committee has chosen the campaign theme, sharing our storehouse of gifts. Many of you will recognize this theme that comes from Don Jefferson's inspirational words to us in her last sermon in August. We are so grateful for all the contributions you have made this year in response to our troubled world. Gifts to feed those in need, help for our immigrants and those with medical debt, contributions for our own community as well as all the other charities that many of you support. This fall, we ask you to turn your attention to our own congregation. As you are able, please try to catch up with your pledges for 2020 as we prepare for our stewardship campaign. Our support to the operating fund of Little River is crucial for our church to thrive. Our staff and our building are the foundation on which we stand as a community. In the next two months, you will hear reflections from some of our boards and committees on how our pledges are used to live out the LRUCC mission. We look forward to a Sunday at the end of October when we will consecrate our pledges for the new year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. Over the next couple of weeks, we will hear more about stewardship for 2021. But if you would like to fulfill your pledge for 2020 or make a gift to the church, you can do so now in a variety of ways. You can continue to mail a check to the church if that is your preference, but you can also go to our website and click on our donate online page. It'll take you to an interface that looks like this, where you can enter your pledge amount or give to one of our special offerings. You can also go to our action and outreach page where you can continue to give to the Congregation Action Network's COVID-19 emergency fund. This money from this fund goes to support our immigrant neighbors, um, most of whom aren't eligible for federal and state funding. It also goes to support folks in sanctuary uh, who aren't able to work right now. Friends, for all the blessings that will be made possible with these offerings, we give God thanks and praise. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures dear below. Praise God above the heavenly host, Creator Christ and Holy Ghost. Our gratitude continues for this congregation's gift of enthusiastic participation in our Central Atlantic Conference's Faith and Democracy Get Out the Vote initiative. 27 volunteers wrote a total of 1,300 postcards to registered voters of color in Texas to encourage early voting. The nonpartisan message asked recipients to tell five friends with the goal of dramatically increasing the impact of the 1,300 cards. Jean Wheelock, Drew Nettinga, and I are gratified by Little River's response. As you will see, our volunteers included new members and seasoned members, young and not so young.
Thank you very much to all. Next up is phone banking, followed by text banking. Your participation surely helps get out the vote. Together, we can make a seismic shift toward justice and true democracy in this nation. Fringe, as you'll see from the slide that is now appearing on the screen, uh, well, that's that slide. Uh, this will be a bidding prayer. And at the end of each petition, I will say, God, our creator, and then you are invited to respond, guide us in truth and love. So let us pray together. Loving God, creator of this world, who is the source of our wisdom and understanding, watch over this nation as we move ever closer to the election. Help us to see how our faith informs our voice and our vote and gives us our power. God, our creator, guide us in truth and love. We give thanks for the right to vote. Help us to protect this privilege and responsibility with the care and awareness it merits, realizing that our vote matters, that it is an act of faith. God, our creator, Guide us in truth and love. Guide us through this election as a nation, state, and community as we vote for those who will work on our behalf and on behalf of our communities. Help us to cast our vote that will better our community and our world so it may reflect the values Christ taught us. God, our creator, guide us in truth and love. Help us. Create communities that will build your kingdom here on earth, communities that will protect the poor, stand up for the vulnerable, advocate for those who are not seen and heard, and listen to everyone's voice. God, our creator, guide us in truth and love. We pray for this nation at odds with itself and deeply divided. May we come together for the common good and do as you have called us, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. God, our creator, guide us in truth and love. Help us act out of love and mercy and justice rather than out of arrogance and fear. God, our creator, guide us in truth and love. Lord, continue to guide us as we work for the welfare of this world we pray for places that are torn by violence, that they may know peace. God, our creator, guide us in truth and love. We pray for communities who are struggling with inequality, unrest, and fear. May we all work toward reconciliation with one another and with you. God, our creator, guide us in truth and love. Help us to listen in love work together in peace, and collaborate with one another as we seek the betterment of our community and our world. God, our creator, guide us in truth and love. And finally, O oh God, hear the joys and concerns that we've shared with you this morning. Rejoice with those who've shared good news. Be present in the lives of those who are struggling with issues big and small. Let your abundant and healing love surround the sick and the dying. And be present with all of us as this week we face the challenges that lie ahead. God, our creator, 
guide us in truth and love. We close these prayers saying together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, may we go forward to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Let us covenant not to accept easy answers or succumb to apathy, but to seek God's will in all that we do. May the peace of God, the love of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you now and forever. Amen. Oh.